Hello, and thank you for joining us. My name is Justin Patterson, the MC for this presentation. I have a very unique pleasure of welcoming you to Japan Challenge for Society 5.0, Accelerate Innovation with Japan. Now, this is a very, very exciting contest, and it's open to startups from anywhere around the world. It's hosted by the Japan External Trade Organization, or JETRO, and co-hosted by the Japan Electronics and Information Technology Industries Association, JETA, and CTEC 2021 Online. The purpose of this project is to call for promising technologies or practical proposals to resolve three major societal issues that Japan is facing through cross-border collaborations. Japan has the potential to be a pioneer in societal issues, so let's get started right away and take a brief look at these three challenges. Challenge number one, environmental friendliness. Our expert on this topic for today is Ms. Eriko Suzuki, the Managing Director at Empower Partners. She'll explain the current situation and why Japan needs your solutions. Eriko, if you would. Hello, so thank you. It's my honor today to speak about environmental and sustainable technologies for Japan. So I have four slides for you today, uh, including this very brief introduction about myself. So very briefly, I have two sides on this slide, one about myself very quickly again, and then one about my fun, which Justin kindly introduced. So briefly about myself, I'm Eriko Suzuki, and my background has been a combination of finance and venture capital. So I started out in investment banking, and then I went into a drone startup, uh, very lucky for me. And, and then I ventured into the space of venture capital. And throughout my venture capital career, I have been focusing quite a lot on socially impactful startups at companies such as Mistletoe, Fresco Capital, and now Empower. And here on the left side, I have some investments that I've made in my past career, such as Ninja Cart in India, who is doing logistics for the agriculture supply chain in India, Compology in the US, San Francisco-based company who's doing uh, waste management uh, using IoT technologies. And then I have Spire Global, a nanosatellite company, again from San Francisco, also in Glaxton, et cetera. And about myself at my latest uh, venture capital empower partners, we are integrating ESG into venture capital investing. And I'd love to talk about that more in the next few slides. But as you can see, I've been very passionate about this space of social impact. And as you can imagine, environment and sustainability is a big part of it. So moving on, uh, the next slide hopefully is of interest to you. So I'll be laying out the opportunities and challenges that I see within Japan. And then in the next slide, I'll do an overview about what kind of technologies there already exist in Japan and where you can perhaps step in. So first about the opportunities and challenges. So interestingly in Japan, we have quite a few uh, monumental opportunities, we believe, that are happening in the environmental space. So you may have seen our Prime Minister Suga has announced that we want to become carbon neutral by 2050. So this is a very large goal, as you can imagine, and we need a lot of uh, forces, whether it's from technology or governmental support from the private side, public side, etc. So we find that a huge opportunity, as you can see on the right hand side, some types of new energy, clean energy type uh, products. And then there's another boom that is happening within the SDG and ESG concept. And again, I'll explain a little bit more about ESG, how it relates to the venture capital work I'm doing, but also overall what, what is happening within ESG. And then the next one is the boom of startups. So I have a small chart here. This is really just for an image in your mind, but the startup scene in Japan is finally growing within the last five, 10 years, and in fact has been growing sevenfold. And so you can see that a lot more uh, young talent is venturing into the startup space. A lot more capital is going in. So we find it a very exciting time for companies, even abroad, to enter into Japan. And finally, within this environmental space, this is a very qualitative point, but I find that Japan has a proximity to nature and a cultural affinity to honoring nature. I don't know if you've heard of terms like shinrin yoku. So there is a, a term called bathing in nature. And so right now, although the world does need a lot more uh, solutions to make our world sustainable, I think it's part, been part of our Japanese culture to honor nature, etc. So you'll see some of that in the coming slides. And so those are the opportunities, and I hope you find them exciting. Some of the remaining challenges are, even though capital into startups have been growing, such long-term capital, which is needed, 
for energy type companies, energy type technologies, etc., are still lacking. So we don't have in Japan yet the Jeff Bezos types or Bill Gates type、uh, long term impactful capital. And so that is where companies like or organizations like Jetro come in to help match、uh, pri private and public space. Another challenge is the deep technologies in Japan are there, as you can imagine. However, commercialization of it is still at a nascent stage. So, having companies from abroad, abroad coming in and merging these deep technologies and making them more commercial will be very important for us. Another one is diversity in the ecosystem in a very broad sense. So, having different people from different disciplines, different genders, different ethnicities will be very important for Japan. And then another final challenge is the literacy around sustainability and environment is still low in Japan, perhaps compared to the West or European countries. So, we need a lot more、uh, market education. So, those are some of the challenges. I'm going to skip over to the overview of what we're seeing in Japan now. So, I've broken down into six areas how sustainable and environmental technologies are right now in Japan. And if you find a space that you'd like to fill, please do contact us in this program at Jetro. So, within the broad sustainability and environmental space, there's food and agriculture, retail type technologies, energy type technologies, and then there's biochemical, bioengineering, synthetic biology, materials companies. Then there's a broad sector again within that called mobility, as you can imagine, and finally, waste management. And perhaps you can see it laid out in this page. There are some interesting technologies burgeoning in Japan. However, there's still a lot of gaps to be filled. For example, in the right upper hand corner, the renewable energy space, as you can imagine, requires a huge amount of capital and you know, groundbreaking technologies. And in Japan, we're not seeing that yet. We have some companies working out of universities like Kyoto University, Tokyo University, but there's room for much more collaboration with global、uh, technologies as well. Other gaps are in the bottom half corner. However, in the top、uh, upper half, such as food and ag tech, we're seeing a lot of great in innovation in Japan, which is unique to Japan, whether it's cellular agriculture or、um, IoT for growing rice. So, again, if you find any of these spaces interesting to you, do apply to this program and reach out. Thank you. So, that was me, Eriko, from Empower Partners. Eriko, thank you very much. You know, just listening to that presentation right now, it really made me realize that there's so much potential in Japan, but there's still a lot of development that really needs to happen.、Uh, so, before we go on to our next presentation, let's get some comments from our other presenters. So,、uh, Eddie, if you just give us a few words, what do you think here about the presentation? Thank you, Justin san. I totally agree with Eriko san that there is a huge gap to fill in the fields of biochemical materials, mobility, and waste management and recycling. In terms of recycling, I think it is very important for Japanese manufacturers to create products that are easy to recycle. For example, you need to design products that are easy to disassemble or to attach electronic chips to all electrical appliances from the manufacturing stage so that products can be collected and sorted more efficiently. And yes, Japanese companies are in a boom of SDGs and ESG, so there are big opportunities for startups all over the world to improve environmental friendliness. Of Japan. Thank you. Thank you. Philip, what about you? What do you think listening to the presentation just now? There's a lot of in,、uh, information in there. Yes. What do you think? Yeah.、Um, thank you, Eriko, for the presentation. And I completely agree with the comment as well.、Um, gap to fill definitely seems like a key word in terms of where Japan wants to be and is right now.、Um, you know, it, it mentioned there's a lot of boom right now. You know, you, you see a lot of the people with the SDG, SDG badges and a lot of the, the government agencies and corporates making really grand gestures and statements on how they want to be in terms of where they're at 2030, 2040, 2050. And beyond.、Um, but there is still a lot to do in terms of commercializing these businesses.、Um, so it, it is known in Japan. There's a lot of good research, there's a lot of good technology, there's a lot of good initiatives, but it doesn't necessarily transition into business.、Um, so I think it really takes a lot of collaboration and partnerships to turn these technologies into actual initiative, initiatives and、uh, actual movements so that we really can hit these goals that we set.、Um, so this is where I think we can really use help from overseas,、uh, like startups,、uh, to be able to hit those goals. Okay, moving on to challenge number two labor shortage and improving productivity. Our expert on this topic for today is Ms. Eri Tamagawa, researcher at Mitsubishi Research Institute Incorporation's Future Co Creation Unit 
Initiative for Co-Creating the Future. She'll talk a little bit about the current situation and why Japan needs your solutions. So, if you would. Thank you, Justin Sam. I am Eri Tamagawa of Mitsubishi Research Institute. Uh, labor shortage and low productivity are very important societal problems in Japan. And MRI was one of Japan's first think tanks, and we have been providing research and consulting services over these issues. Let me briefly introduce ICF of MRI. The initiative for co-creating the future, innovating the platinum society, has been established to tackle the world's most pressing challenges through open innovation. With more than 500 ICF members, including Japanese large companies, startups, local governments, and universities, we use open innovation to co-create solutions, implement them in the real world, and produce collective impact toward resolving societal issues. As you may know, Japan is facing rapid decrease of working age population. The number of those aged 15 to 64 was 77 million in 2015 and will decrease to 69 million in 2030 and 53 million in 2050 due to very low birth rate in Japan. Another big issue Japan is facing is low productivity. Japan's labor productivity has been 60 to 70 percent of that of the United States and has been farther falling in recent years. What is worse, Japan's labor productivity is especially low in the largest sector of the working population, such as food service, accommodations, wholesale and retail, transportation and warehousing, and construction industries. But I believe societal issues are the mother of innovation. Japan needs innovative solutions to improve productivity by decreasing necessary resource input, for example, using AI and robots to achieve high efficiency and by increasing output, in other words, increasing added value. Here are some examples of solutions. In Japan, the increasing number of seniors have difficulty living unassisted, and currently 1.9 million caregivers work in Japan. This is AI support service to create care plan for seniors. The introduction of care plan assistant AI reduces the burden of caregivers. In Japan, social infrastructure was intensively built 60 years ago, and they will soon begin to worsen all at once. As national and local governments face financial difficulties, the monetary burden associated with maintenance and management has become a significant problem. The cost of maintenance, management, and renewal of social infrastructure will continue to cost 5 trillion Japanese yen per year. So there are high expectations for a service to diagnose deterioration in building inspections using image analysis technology with drones and AI. The average age in Japan's agricultural sector has reached 66 years old, and farming population is rapidly declining. If current situation persists, the farming population will drop to 1.7 million in 2025, which is 22% smaller than that of 2010. So, power-assisted suits and robots are already used to support farmers, and technological innovation have been made through the combination of GPS and sensors. However, it has yet to reach completely autonomous farming because of safety concerns. Japan is facing driver shortage due to the declining and aging population. Delivery drivers were predicted to reach a shortage of 100,000 in 2020. This deficiency could lead to 1.7 trillion Japanese yen loss in delivery services. Expected solutions include automation of delivery, the use of drones, and also communication tools to reduce re-delivery. Drones are especially expected in underpopulated areas, such as islands, mountainous regions, and coastal areas. Delivery service in these areas could also serve as a means to check in with senior citizens, resulting in new value. To improve productivity, not only high efficiency, but also increasing value is important. New services have been created to codify and store previously tacit cultivation expertise. It also provides instruction on cultivation methods based on soil analysis and weather information. For example, this is a computer program by Plant Life Systems to grow high-quality tomatoes that taste better and sell better. Tele-existence technology is attracting attention for its potential to expand human capabilities and create new value. First, a user will synchronize their senses and physical functions with a robot. Then the user can operate equipment remotely in real time. Improvements have been made to robotic-assisted surgery systems 
and autonomous working robots at construction sites are also under development. Well, I look forward to your innovative solutions to improve productivity of Japan. Thank you very much. Eddie, thank you very much. Really listening to that presentation as an American, I think there's like a lot of problems that you mentioned that are kind of going to be applicable to the United States in uh, the near future. Uh, let's uh, get some opinions from our other uh, presenters. So let's uh, start off with Mr. Sone. Any thoughts? Yes. Well, I believe that uh, the challenges now Japan faces are ones that other countries will face in near future. For example, we face population decline as our citizens age, as Erisa mentioned. This same social issue is also emerging in Europe and other East Asian nations. Therefore, if you can successfully collaborate with Japanese enterprises and come up with solutions to our challenges, you would have a great opportunity to apply them in other countries. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I was kind of noticing like most of the time through her presentation, I just saw you quietly nodding most of the time. So yeah, Eriko, do you have anything you'd like to add? Yes, thank you. So you caught me red handed. <laughs> yeah, I very much agree with Eddie Sun's presentation. So I have perhaps two points that I wanted to make. One is the robotics and automation uh, factor in Japan is, of course, very huge. So when I was working at the drone startup, that was exactly our use case. We were doing uh, automatic surveying of construction sites because the construction age population is also aging as well. And so it's very different dynamics to uh, elsewhere where there would be pushback from labor unions, etc. of, oh, we don't want to automate. But in Japan, it's welcoming automation. So robotics is huge. But at the same time, the next comment I wanted to make was on the software side. Uh, in Japan, it is an aging population, even within the regular working class, uh, the office worker type uh, community. And there is still a digital divide in adopting these technologies. And, and as you can see, that is why uh, productivity in Japan is low. So I'm excited to see not only you know robotics and automation type technologies come into Japan, but really software solutions that will help the ordinary citizens in Japan, the salary men's in suits that you might see on trains, help them live a bit more of a fulfilling life. So that's another thing I wanted to comment, but thank you. Philip, any thoughts? Yeah, sure. No, I, I think I, I definitely like the point of, you know, crisis breeds innovation. So I think there are so many of these challenges that we've heard so far that Japan is facing. Uh, but this is really a huge opportunity then for Japan to really utilize open innovation to be able to tackle some of these challenges. Um, one area I really liked is kind of the agriculture aspect, because it is really important for Japan as a high quality agriculture society to create solutions to continue that quality, not just for Japan, but for the world. Um, so I think that's kind of a very under uh, discussed uh, topic within Japan, uh, but somewhere we can really use technology. Um, so thank you for that. Oh, thank you very much. Awesome. Well, just as like Philip said, you know, crisis breeds innovation. I think it's true. And it's, in a way, these are the problems. It's a crisis and we need, you know, even further innovation. So I really think there's a need for the people out there to, you know, kind of take a look at this and hope they can come up with some really great solutions. And our last one, challenge number three, smart and resilient Japan. Our expert on this topic today is Mr. Philip Vincent, managing partner of East Asia Plug and Play and CEO of Plug and Play Japan. He's gonna explain the current situation and why Japan needs your solutions. So if you would, Philip, take it away. Yep, thank you, Justin. Um, hi everybody, my name is Philip Vincent. I'm the head of Plug and Play Japan. And today the topic I received is smart and resilient Japan. So that is what I'll talk about. Uh, the, the topic is quite broad. Um, so I kept my presentation broad as well. I'll talk a little bit about kind of the challenges and opportunity as Japan as a whole, uh, but also at the same time dive deep a little bit into um, what we do in terms of smart city, which I believe part of this topic is. Um, so a little bit about Japan and Tokyo as a startup ecosystem. Um, you know, there's a lot of uh, kind of rankings out there. How good of a startup ecosystem are these cities? And Tokyo, you know, historically hasn't done well, but recently it has. Uh, Japan as a country, I believe, is ranked 21st in this ranking here by Start of Blink. Uh, and Tokyo is now 15th. And you look at other cities besides Tokyo, you also see Kyoto, Osaka. It's not just Tokyo that are working on these startup solutions. There are also goals set by the Tokyo or Jap uh, Japanese government to create 20 unicorns by 2023, uh, which I believe we're about 10 now. So we're trying to create 10 more. 
Uh, and government's really, uh, really serious about innovation. They're, they're trying to uh, push these initiatives and projects and goals uh, that are really kind of kickstarting a lot of innovation. And, and again, not just to Tokyo, but other cities. Um, there are eight cities that the government recently selected as kind of startup hubs. The four main city cities being Tokyo, Central, uh, which is areas like uh, Nagoya, where Toyota is, or Aichi, where Toyota is, uh, Kansai area, which is Osaka, Kyoto, Kobe, and then Fukuoka, and then the other startup cities that you see down there. Uh, and I won't go through these, but this is also a strategy that uh, the cabinet office set out to be able to utilize these startup cities to help the start uh, startups in these ecosystems. And finally, uh, another challenge that we're facing is what we call the 2025 digital cliff. Uh, this is where there's going to be a huge shortage of uh, IT resources. Um, it'll double to about 430,000 by 2025. Uh, more than 60% of core systems in Japanese companies will be legacy systems, so that's going to be a huge issue. If Japan really doesn't embrace uh, digital transformation and some of these uh, technologies, it will uh, cost huge losses for, for Japan as a whole. And so a little bit about smart cities. Um, this is, again, kind of a huge area in which Japan as a whole, kind of the private and the public sector is really trying to uh, put efforts in terms of engagement. There are a lot of initiatives that are going on um, that could be helpful in terms of open innovation. So Smart City Institute Japan is created in 2019 as a nonprofit consortium uh, where plug and play is a part of it as well to really kind of bring together research efforts and again, the public and private sectors uh, for the creation of smart cities. And then there's the Super City Act uh, established last year. Uh, this is to be able to overcome some of the regulations uh, to be able to create these citizen, cities. And we all know that uh, regulation could be a roadblock at a lot of times in Japan. Uh, and then finally, uh, Woven Planet uh, by Toyota. This is one of the more uh, famous smart city initiatives in the world. Uh, but if you get a company such as Toyota really working on solutions like this uh, and, and really opening up uh, their platform to collaborate with external vendors, especially overseas, it really gives hope in terms of some of the project that Japan is ran, uh, running that could be international. Uh, and then, of course, plug and play, we do run a smart cities program. So we have seen some of the collaboration that has taken place between corporations and startups and then, of course, startups abroad. Um, so we do run these program in a lot of different areas around the world and have a lot of different uh, subcategories here that we run. But I'd like to go into a little bit about uh, an example that we've seen where our large corporate has worked with international startups. Um, so the one we like to use is uh, a case with uh, Obayashi Corporation and how they've worked at three different startups during their tenure of our very first program running the Smart City. Uh, the first company is called Be Inventor, uh, which is through their digitization uh, goal that Obayashi has set. Uh, this part of their goal is to really digitize the analog data to build data infrastructure. Uh, and, and that company is based out of Hong Kong. The second company, Clue, is based out of Jakarta. This is part of the, uh, the Obayashi's digitalization uh, strategy. And this strategy is to utilize, utilize data and combine it with uh, technologies like AI to reform the business process. Uh, and finally, digital transformation. And they work with a company called Kinex. This is a uh, company in Japan, but also has um, non-Japanese uh, founders and uh, employees in the company. And this strategy for them is to create new value and experiences through the built foundation of the digital twin. So it's really great to see a corporation kind of uh, align their vision with startups and then of course work with international startups. And this is some of the uh, projects that we would like to see uh, kind of solutions that would be created through this challenge today. And finally, uh, deep technology, I won't go into this uh, too much, but uh, you know, the core of Japan again is research. Uh, so some of this deep technology in areas like health and materials is a huge area and an area where corporations need the support of startups abroad. Uh, this, is, this is some of the areas that we'd like to see this challenge tackle. So that's it from me today. Thank you very much. So yeah, I think it's very obvious that you know the Japanese government is putting a lot of effort into you know digital transformation. But I think sometimes as a government, there's you know a limit as to what they can really do you know at the end. So you really just in any sense, you really need a help of you know external you know vendors. You need help of like you know startups. And I think that just provides a lot of opportunities. Uh, so what do you guys think, uh, Eriko? Let's start off with you. 
Yeah, sure. Thank you. So firstly, thank you for the great presentation, Philip. And um, the smart city concept, like Philip said, is very broad, but I think can be super impactful because it's really about our lives. And just two points there is that, you know, the past smart city concepts, as you know, everyone in the globe knows, have often been a little bit superficial about, you know, IoT this and we can put a sensor here and somehow our lives will be magically better. But I think that, you know, it's been proven that that's not necessarily the case unless it's really designed to have humans first and humans central. So uh, what I like about the recent initiatives, whether it's, you know, Woven Planet with Toyota, which is, of course, a company that, you know, represents almost Japan, uh, it's really putting at the humans at the center. So just some anecdotal things, it really is helping um, the older age, you know, silver economy communicate better with each other, or it's perhaps helping uh, track certain things so that people can be more wellness minded and take care of their you know self and, and whether it's through mindfulness or um, other community interactions so i'm very excited about putting humans first but using technology and data because what data what you don't measure you can't really improve so with that i'm very excited yeah thank you in the end it is for humans right <laughs> uh, eddie what do you think thank you i found that the case study on digital twin very interesting Digital twin technology is useful at construction stage on site, of course, but also it can be used for maintenance of infrastructure. It can diagnose aging degradation at the, and at the time of disasters such as earthquakes. It can immediately identify damages of buildings and bridges. These technologies also allow for instant update on the disaster situation, thus ensuring appropriate evacuation decisions, effective communication, and efficient recovery efforts. I think smart cities can be resilient cities, and new solutions for smart cities are imperative for Japan, a disaster-prone country. Thank you. Well, it really sounds like we do have a lot of opportunities, so please take a look. Well, I think we can see that this contest has a lot to offer. And with that, I'd like to ask the Executive Vice President of Jetro, Mr. Ichiro Sone, to explain the challenge contest. Jetro is a Japanese governmental organization supporting cross-border collaboration between Japan and the overseas startups, while accelerating open innovation activities in Japan. We launched this challenge contest to create and boost collaboration between startups abroad and their Japanese counterparts. The contest is divided into three categories, as we mentioned. You can find examples of sp specific technologies and solutions here. The contest is being launched on a Viva technology platform, and you can get information and file an application on the page there, titled Japan Challenge for Society 5.0. We are calling for startups with technologies and solutions related to the individual challenges. There are three rewards, a chance to exhibit at CTEC 2021 online, mentoring by top Japanese experts, and an invitation to a learning trip to Japan. Let's now watch a video message from our co-host and partner of the challenge, CTEC.
Hello, all Viva Technology participants. I'm Kyush Shikano, executive producer of the CTEC Management Office. I'm excited to hear that the Japan Challenge for Society 5.0 has been launched. As a CPS, Cyber Fiscal System and IoT exhibition that encourages innovation and collaboration around the world, the CTEC has been promoting innovative technologies, devices, and solutions from startups, universities, and a variety of the companies through our co-creation park at CTEC. If you are the startup, we would love to have you participate in the Japan Challenge for Society 5.0, since Japan is currently facing a variety of the social issues and Japan also needs the solution to those issues solved by innovative startups. Through this challenge, we hope that CTEC will provide the opportunities of newly created business with the Japanese companies to promote the ideas of Society 5.0. We are looking forward to having you all at CTEC 2021 online. Thank you. Through this video, we've explained Japan's social issues as well as the challenge contest. We sincerely hope for solutions to realize Society 5.0, a concept for our future. Please apply for this challenge and propose your solutions. As Japan is a leading nation in social issues, we can provide you with plenty of opportunities to connect with Japanese corporations, local governments, and various stakeholders in Japan. We are excited to collaborate with you to help solve Japan's social issues and partner for a bright future. We hope you can join us in Japan. Well, I think you've had a chance to get acquainted with three of the most urgent problems that uh, Japan is facing today and see the opportunities that these challenges present. We hope to hear from you soon. I'd like to also say once again, thank you very much to our three presenters, Eriko, Eddie, and Philip. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for watching. If you think you can contribute to the future and that your technology or solutions will make a difference here in Japan, please visit our challenge website at Viva Technology. The application deadline is July 31st. Don't miss this opportunity. Let's create Society 5.0 together and generate innovation here in Japan.